welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House U.S. to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This is episode 7, Tibetan Uprising Day, March 10th, My Appeal to the World. Happy Tibetan Freedom Day, March 10th, 2015. We are four years or so past His Holiness the Dalai Lama's own speeches that he used to give every year. And among other things, today we celebrate the publication of his book, arranged by Sophia Strill Rever, in French originally, which Tibet House U.S. just published, called My Appeal to the World where 50 of his speeches from 1961 to 2011 are published in excerpts are published with uh, Sophia's commentary, placing them in historical context. We're very happy to do that because His Holiness, since he resigned from political office in the Tibetan government in exile, he no longer gives the March 10th speech. Although he personally, of course, commemorates the heroism of all those Tibetans who passed away, who died in resisting the Chinese military in Lhasa in 1959 on March 10th, which has become, they used to call it, or they I guess still call it, Tibet Uprising Day. And um, some people maybe want to call it Tibetan Independence Day. And, but I call it Tibet Freedom in Day because to avoid the autonomy independence struggle, which I consider a little bit academic rather than vital to the interests of the Tibetan people. So everyone knows that Tibet has always been independent until 1950 and the Chinese invasion. And although it was a protectorate of various non-Chinese dynasties, the Mongolian Yuan dynasty and the Manchurian Qing dynasty, it was never ruled directly from Beijing or any Chinese capital. And even the Mongolians and Manchurians never directly ruled Tibet. It was always ruled by Tibetan governments because no one else can really live on that plateau because, but the Tibetans. And nature has made Tibet a free country because no one can really live there. The Chinese communists were able to invade, occupy, annex, and they currently control because of the technology of trucks and planes and trains now, and the people rotate who live there, they can't live there all year round or they get heart disease. So we don't really have to worry about the freedom of Tibet. It is free, it's just temporarily messed up and occupied by people who are sort of wearing gas masks, you know, because they only have 47% of sea level oxygen in Tibet and it overstrains their lungs and heart and unless you have genetic adaptation from thousands of generations, as the Tibetans do, you cannot live there year-round and survive. And women cannot produce babies there. The placenta won't form properly and so on, except Tibetan women. So that's the first thing. Now, when I addressed uh, the live crowd of the Tibetans in front of the UN in the Dag Hammarskjöld Plaza uh, on this day, I spoke to them, what was in my mind was the story of Shakyamuni Buddha. Because this year, the March 10th, is very close to March 5th, which is the day, a full moon day, of the two weeks of the Munlam festival that Tibet used to have for 500 and some years, uh, almost 600 years, from 1409. Um, and um, was interrupted here and there a little bit by some persecution, internal Tibetan persecution in the 16th century from Zhang, and then uh, by the communists since uh, they came. 
most of the time, with a little break in the early 80s. And what they celebrate there is a time of two weeks when Shakyamuni Buddha performed miracles for all the kings of India during his lifetime. And the most miracle that I really like, for his, which he produced for his father, actually he was giving teachings, but before the teachings he would do a kind of miracle just to get everyone's attention. But for his father he did a specific one where he, two Buddhas, two Shakyamuni Buddhas came out of his heart so there were three of them, and then each of them had two come out of their heart, and then each of them had two come out of their heart, and then each of them, and so on, until it was a rapid-fire multiplication. And, um, <coughs> and uh, all the people present, including his father, saw Shakyamuni Buddhas, tiny micro Shakyamuni Buddhas, in every atom, and even their optic nerve was filled with tiny micro Shakyamuni Buddhas in their nose, and their hands and everything. So Shakyamuni Buddha was in, perceived by them as being present in every atom of the universe. So if he was every atom of the universe, that was the miracle that he showed before giving a teaching. And he then said to his dad, in my imagination, this is actually not recorded, but I think he was saying to his dad, hey dad, I know you've been disappointed that I'm merely a Buddha, and I didn't remain a wheel-turning imperial king, and conquer the whole world for you, as it had been predicted I could have. So I'm sorry about that, but you have to say I'm sort of all over it, wouldn't you say? <laughs> and apparently his father attained our hatship, you know, the nirvana, personally. Somehow he suddenly felt relieved from that kind of nagging disappointment that he had experienced. Terrible thing, poor fellow. Twice. First, when Buddha himself escaped and refused to serve as the king of Shakya kingdom. And then second, when his grandson, Buddha's son, also escaped and became a bhikshu, mendicant, and uh, also became enlightened, but also didn't serve as king. And so then he had to hand off to some fairly incompetent cousin. And uh, then eventually Shakya was invaded and it was like a bad scene. Somehow when you become enlightened and vulnerable, and you don't care about life and death because you live beyond it, you know, you, you tend to be taken advantage of in history. But now, maybe we're going to have a new situation where everyone is going to be vulnerable under the leadership of His Holiness, the great 14th Dalai Lama. So I told that story to the young Tibetans who were gathered in that gathering. And one thing I noticed about this year's March 10th March was there was, seemed to be less anger toward the Chinese, Although everyone was wearing, a lot of people were wearing posters with the names of the Tibetans in Tibet who have immolated themselves, 142 of them in the last few years, last four, five, six years. And there, so there was grim looks on some people's faces, but the sort of angry like China evil, China shame, China bad, this kind of thing was not there as much as we want our rights, talk Xi Jinping, talk to Dalai Lama, we want... We want a decent treatment in, in, in a, that way. But there was a, the Tibetans were in their more normal, better humor, which I was pleased. But anyway, what I had to tell them was, like Shakyamuni did that in a way, the Tibetan nation has had a similar thing happen, which is that they, by being vulnerable and giving up their empire a thousand years ago, not having a really much of a standing army in the recent years, pledging their culture through Buddhism to nonviolence and so on, they were vulnerable and they were totally chewed up in the last 60 years, 65 years, by the Chinese communists and um, in a way by industrial militarism of the China, and nowadays by industrial consumerism of the Chinese communist sort of tourist industry where they've been made into kind of a tourist oddity on the one hand, and on the other hand their mind being mined into environmental obliteration uh, by Chinese PLA business interests, public liberation army businesses. So they're really suffering badly in Tibet. And I said, so you've been crushed, and you've been, there's been a genocide going on about you, I said, and that's just terrible. And yet, by the amazing miracle is that you are all over the world. Here you are in New York City, free to give your voice to the world. And all over the world, in Australia, in Japan, everywhere you have a voice. In India, Nepal, a little bit suppressed in Nepal now, 
And of course, sadly, you have no voice at all in your own homeland in Tibet, which is very tragic. And it's worse than ever, almost. It seems almost like the final kill, the final kill is in. And that we're not glossing that over, but we're so happy here in New York. And we gloss that over, and you're not glossing it over. On the other hand, the people doing the killing are objects of pity. If you remember the His Holiness the Dalai Lama's famous poem, they are to be pitied because by their ill deeds and by their destructive behavior, they are destroying their own evolutionary trajectory. They will be badly reborn. They will suffer terribly in, in this life and future life. And the people who they torture are suffering now, but because they have the basic good heart of the Tibetan culture, the Tibetan precious Buddhist culture of love and kindness and embracing beings as their kin, and all beings are my mother and this sort of thing with the heart of Buddhism, because of that, even though they are being persecuted and tortured, etc., there's an inner energy and joy and an ability to face death and this after death and nobody gets out of everything by just dying that's just the beginning of another cycle and so the ones who are doing the killing are also very much to be pitied so it's inappropriate it is appropriate to protest them resist them oppose them forcefully try to get them to wake up from their bad deeds but it is not appropriate to hate them to be deeply angry to poison yourself with hatred and anger for them. That ruins you, actually. It doesn't really hurt them. It makes you less effective, actually, in opposing them. Like a martial artist, the martial artist is effective in dealing with a violent person or animal or anything by being cool about it, although forceful, and sort of dodging and keeping their balance, you know. If you, get, if you lose your temper, you go off balance and you lose the martial arts contest. And so Tibet is winning, actually, with the world's thing. And then I, I incur, then I, went, I said to them, furthermore, just because you maybe have a basic smile on your face, you're able to take a joke. I can too. I made a joke to them about how I'm honored nowadays by the, the Shukden Dolgyal followers, uh, uh, that they make me a puppet. I'm a puppet on the string from His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And I told them that was really silly, and that I wish I was a puppet of, of such a great person, but unfortunately I'm an imperfect supporter and friend, but um, not so perfect as doing, guess what he was by being a puppet, I just am not that well connected. I wish I was. He'd keep me in his pocket, I'd love to live in his pocket and be his puppet. And I made them laugh, you know, in the middle of being protests and the, the China and so on, they laughed, and I was pleased with that, and I said, even though that's the case, that doesn't mean we are turned our backs or we're somehow feeling, okay, we're fine. And we don't care about the horrible situation in Tibet. But even there, we have to take pride in a strange way. On one hand, we deplore the young men and women, lay persons and monastics who are immolating themselves to give their own bodies to show that they are free people because Tibetans are free in their hearts. Anyone who owns their own mind and their own life and can give it where they want is in a sense truly free. Those who are so terrified of all their possessions and their body and their life and they're terrified and they are not free, they're slaves of their emotion and then they can be enslaved by other people. But Tibetans have a cultural wisdom, even not necessarily fully enlightened, but they have a cultural wisdom by the gift of so many thousands of enlightened Tibetans over this many centuries and before that the great enlightened Indians who brought the Dharma to them and Buddha himself, that they show that they're free by giving up their body in an intolerable situation. In a situation where hatred and anger would rise in people in other cultures and they would go out shooting and killing some of their oppressors before they died, you know, in sort of a, a, in a Rambo last stand kind of thing, you know. Real one where you get killed, you know, you don't just do it and shoot down other people and you survive for Hollywood. No, a real one where you actually get killed. They don't do that. Instead, they say to that oppressor who tortures them and imprisons them and beats them and beats their loved ones and kills them and so forth, they say to those people armed police and secret police and Gunganju and all these people, they say, they say, you can't kill me and you can't oppress me because I will be, give my own body to make a statement to the world, as an offering to make a statement to the world 
that this is a wrong situation and I won't hurt you in the process, but I reject your power over me by giving up my body. So we have to admire that kind of nonviolent warriorship. Of course, there's the violence against the physical body, of the, but that's not the self for them. Such people, their real self is a soul being, a, a, an evolutionary being, a bodhisattva being that is heading toward Buddhahood, life after life. And they're not destroying that by giving up their body in a gift for the benefit of their community, for the benefit of all beings, for the benefit of their oppressor, actually, to show that holding onto your body and pressing others who you think are in the way of what you want, your, your mining or your wealth or your land or your name or whatever it is that you think that they're, they're bothering you about, that is wrong. And you're able to transcend that. You know. On the other hand, of course, so, but we deplore that because you could do that in another way by bearing the suffering, loving your enemy, developing your bodhisattva mind, developing your patience, and you know, using your precious human body longer and using that suffering that it's experiencing longer to cultivate change in this life, inner change in this life, even more effectively than just by giving the body of this life. So we don't approve of it, actually. And if you asked us, should I now go immolate myself for the cause, we would say absolutely not. Suffer for the cause. His Holiness feels a pain in his heart every time one of you does that. On the other hand, he doesn't put you down because he wants to honor your heroism in a way. But he certainly doesn't want you doing it. It's, a, it's a complicated. You have to think about it to understand it. People think, oh, since he doesn't sort of forbid you from doing it, in a way he did. He said he didn't think it would be very helpful. Be better ways to use your precious human body, he'd think. But anyway, we remember you after the fact, and we honor you, and we heed your call, and we will stand up for you in every way we can. All of you here are marching to do that, and I think that's really wonderful. I, I spoke to them like that. And then last of all, I said to them, as I say to you now on this podcast, the wonderful thing about the miracle of the power of love in the world and a power of wisdom, which always goes with love, and love goes with wisdom, and wisdom goes with love, always. They, they are not separated, they are not opposite each other, not at all. They go together. And true wisdom and love, the amazing thing about its miracle is that although the governments of the world do not, you know, the one big government, Chinese, actively is destroying your people, and your land, and your precious environment they are destroying and exploiting and wrecking, you know, and by vainly and futilely trying to colonize it and so forth and mine it and grab the water and ruin the downstream livelihood of millions and hundreds of millions, perhaps of billions of people in South Asia. That government and the other governments are sort of, they kind of this, maybe they talk to you, somebody, maybe they visit the, oh no, we don't dare see the Lama or they'll punish us with money, the Chinese government. So they won't even necessarily meet with them or with the president of the government in exile. So they like that, but they ignore you. So you may feel ignored and you may feel the world is colluding in the Chinese genocide of your people, but that would be wrong and you should not get despaired in that way. What it is, all the people in the world love you. We love you here in America, the people. I have heard from reliable sources that the Chinese people underground love you. They're not fooled by the propaganda and the media of the communist regime that you're so bad or you're ungrateful for all the great things they've done for you and you've, so, you know, you've saved them from feudalism and blah, 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 saved them from a happy free life. No, they don't believe that. And they love you, but they don't dare do anything. The Russian people, I know from a fact, love you. The Mongolian people love you. The Indian people love you. The Australian, the Japanese, Everyone on this planet loves you. If the people of this planet controlled their governments, and if the people who are supposed to be servants of the people, you know, even dictatorship is supposed to, China is supposed to be dictatorship of the proletariat, that is, they're supposed to be serving their people. If they were serving their people and executing their people's will, they would see to it that you are free and saved and the country is repaired. And you're a jewel for the world, not just owned by China, owned by anybody who goes there and contributes to it. The waters go flow to India, to Pakistan, to Burma, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam. They flow to all the people down Thailand. They flow from your land. 
the world would see to it that you are precious people in a precious land, sort of a giant theme park, not theme park, but giant environmental free park, even for wildlife to rebuild the wildlife herds and everything. As a jewel of the human planet environment, the roof of the world, the world would see to it that it is restored, repaired, you had your Buddhist culture, you had your free society, whatever, whoever thinks they are responsible for your defense and for your repairing, actually. And His Holiness wants China to keep responsibility because they wrecked you for 60 years and they should repair. They, it costs, they should pay to repair. He's not into that because he wants to be Chinese or something. That's a silly, the people who shout about independence. There's no surrender of Tibetan identity whatsoever in the middle way autonomy. Absolutely not. Tibetans are Tibetans and they have freedom in their heart and the world loves them and in the way they are canaries in the gold, in the, in the coal mine of industrial consumerism and industrial militarism where they are standing for freedom under the worst oppression. And the world, you know, different governments are oppressing, or sometimes there's moments of freedom. Our own American government, they're not serving us. Obama wants to serve, our president does. He tries to serve us. But the Congress there, they're all self-impeached. They work for a few wealthy people. They don't work for our people. They don't do 75% want health insurance, 50% want this, no war, 80% want that. They don't do that. They do what they feel like and what wealthy people who pay their salaries and their corrupt bribes, and campaign contributions, etc., and gerrymandering things. They, and so we have lost our own democracy here. So you Tibetans should realize you are beloved by everyone in the world. Shangri-La, that's good actually that they think of it as Shangri-La. They know, they know that you are suffering and there's a genocide going on in Shangri-La. They know that. But they want Shangri-La. Shangri-La is a state of mind. It's a heart. It's the name of millions of motels and hotels where people go to relax. Even Chinese officials go to Shangri-La Hotel Hong Kong. It's a state of mind in which you represent. It isn't Buddhism only. It, you know, freedom of mind, joyfulness, peacefulness, pleasure of the environment, beautiful environment, etc. This is birthright of all human beings and animals and you represent that with your precious culture. So your struggle, it's good to speak in a in state and write Congress, go to the Senate, tell those people they should do what the American people want them to do. So tell people to do that, but be happy yourselves, excel in the societies where you live, go to every school, learn everything and study your Buddhism and keep your culture alive and thereby is the root of your freedom. By your mindfulness, by your compassion, by your wisdom, by how you, what you contribute to the world around you, what you enjoy in the world around you, that is the key, that's your key, that's your long march. The long march of the Tibetan people is keeping your culture alive. So we were very happy, Tibet House US is a little tiny, feeble, humble, not well-funded institution you know, non-profit institution founded at the request of His Holiness, trying to preserve the culture and present the culture to the Western people so that people fall in love with Tibet. Our slogan is, is love Tibet. We don't pretend we can free it. We don't pretend we can save it. We, but we want people to love it. And then the ones who love it will try to free it and save it. They will. And one thing that I'm supposed to do, because today is the launch day of this book, which we have to, for which we thank His Holiness the Dalai Lama, of course, and uh, Sophia Strill Rivere, the author of the commentaries on His Holiness's speech. And what this book is are the 50 speeches of His Holiness the Dalai Lama given on this March 10th day from 1961, when he was free in India to speak, to 2011, when he resigned from being head of government in exile and turned it over to the Sikyong, you know, to an elected leader with, with great delight, fully implementing democracy in the Tibetan free community in exile, overseas community in exile. And uh, so the French publish, this was originally published in French by Sophia Strill Rivere. And then when I read it and loved it, 
and realized that it wasn't in English, I asked them why, and they said they couldn't get an English publisher, perhaps because the, you know, the freight of China or something, because, you know, these are where His Holiness is a political leader is speaking to his people in all the ups and downs from the 60s until now, for 50 years. So then I had it translated, Tibet House published it, and Hay House is distributing it, and today is its launch day, and so since, in a way, this is part of a rally talk that I'm giving, please, people, and especially Western people, also Tibetans, go back and review this book. And then inside, there's one picture that I want to put, because it's, it shows how he looked like at the time when I first met His Holiness, 50 years ago. There's a picture of him in Dharamsala, uh, even then. And what a sweet expression. And that's when I first met His Holiness 50 years ago. And I didn't understand the Tibetan cause. I was just selfishly looking for Buddhism and the Dharma and freedom and liberation and enlightenment myself, for myself. But slowly and surely he was patient with me and he came, I came to, to study with him and his teachers and his colleagues about the Dharma. I came to feel better about the world. And although not, I didn't get enlightened still because I'm a hard case, but I'm getting there. You're moving in that direction. But what not that sweet? Isn't his face so sweet and nice? That's a picture inside. So 50 years from there to there, and he's, he doesn't give up. He patiently appeals, although the appeal has not yet been heard by those with the power to, to give his people a break. Not yet. Although it's been heard by many millions and hundreds of millions, perhaps billions of people in the world, it's been heard, but not by the governments who who can do something. So let it be heard. May it be heard soon, very, very soon. And long live His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Long live His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Long live His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, for the sake of the, His people, His precious people of precious Tibet, and for this precious planet where we live, all live. membership community and listeners like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, please visit tibethouse.us. For a complete listing of all upcoming Robert Thurman events, please visit Bob Thurman.com. And for upcoming events in the heart of the Catskills in Phoenicia, New York at Menla, please visit menla.us, located just two hours north of New York City.